Hello, everybody. Welcome. John Perry here, and I am joined by my twin brother, identical twin brother, Mike Perry. Welcome. Hello, everybody. And uh, we're... I thought it'd be fun today to, to talk. Mike was asking me questions about virus evolution versus human evolution. You know, if viruses can evolve so fast, how is it that humans can stay a step ahead of viruses and other pathogens? I mean, all pathogens evolve way faster than humans do just because their life cycle is so short. And we were just texting back and forth. Uh, it's probably what, two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and then I'm like, well, let's just have you on. Cause I think, you know, I, the kind of the cool things about, about being a twin is that we have, we have the same brain set up, but of course we've diverged over our lifetimes to do different things with our brains. You've been doing business uh, for the past several years. I've been teaching biology for the past several years, but it's kind of, it's kind of interesting because uh, when Mike and I have conversations with each other, it's sort of like, uh, if Mike's teaching me something that I don't know, it's like me from the future came to teach me something because he, he teaches in the same way that I do. Um, and we have, a, um, I don't know. I, when Mike asks questions, it's the same types of questions that I would ask when I'm learning about this thing for the first time. So it's, it's fun to talk about biology with Mike because yeah, he's, he's asking the same questions that I would have several years ago <laughs> before I was right. so into this. And, uh, you know, vice versa when I'm asking, you know, business questions, but Mike, you wanted to start. So, I mean, we're different in several ways. Um, we've, I mean, I've, I've been non-religious, unreligious for years now since my early twenties and Mike, you are a Christian and you have, um, you said that you wanted to talk about that and how, how Christianity and evolution kind of mix or don't mix for you yeah. before, before so, we dig in. Yeah. Well, first I want to say too, like, I don't know a ton about, um, about evolution other than what I see from your videos and watching Dave Attenborough documentaries and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm just generally interested in all things, science and economics and politics, and math and all that stuff. So I have a general interest, but I'm not an expert. So that's why I have, all these questions, especially with this virus going around, but yeah, yeah um, relating back to like religion and and uh, the theory of evolution. When I was a kid, I can't remember how old I was, maybe like nine or ten. I decided I was going to read through the Old Testament, and um, I got stuck at about Exodus chapter thirty or so because there's five or six chapters in Exodus that go into really deep detail about like really obnoxiously deep detail about how they built their little tents tabernacle. So yeah. it describes <laughs> yeah. everything in there, how big everything is, exactly how they're made. And like, that's where I got stuck as a kid. Like I, I can't read through this. This is way too boring. Um, mm -hmm. But something that stuck out to me right then when I was that young was like, this is what it looks like when this, this author talks about something scientific and technical versus the story of the creation, which is like two short chapters. I think it's like about 60 verses about the creation of absolutely everything. Yeah. He doesn't claim to be a witness. Um, and so right then I made this connection, like, you know, just on a literary basis, it doesn't look to me like the uh, story of the creation of the universe is meant to be a technical um, scientific description of how things are made. So, I mean, and then we had um, we had a Sunday school teacher. I think his name was like David Ohm, when we were kids, who was like really excited about the theory of evolution. And so I've I've never really seen a conflict there. And I know for people who do see a conflict there, me saying that's not gonna change their minds, but maybe it'll make them feel a little less uncomfortable about at least looking into <laughs> the whole theory of evolution. But yeah, but yeah, just state that. Yeah, I had had. Um... So my experience, even though we were grew up in the same house and this went to the same church and everything, was different because uh, one of one of our Sunday schools when we, when we were really young was super anti-evolution, or she she told us in a class maybe you weren't there that day or something, but she told us that um, evolution is a trick by the devil to that 
science, or, you know, it's a trick by scientists to make you, uh, uh, be evil. <laughs> so, um, so I was super terrified of evolution as a kid. You know, I was probably, I don't know. I, I can't, it's hard to tell like timelines. I, I can never tell how old I was when I had a certain thought or saw a certain thing, except for yeah. like when there was times where we moved. So I know that my first memory was right before we moved the first time. So I was, I was three or younger, uh, was my first memory. Um, and I'm, that was just me driving, we were driving in the car and I saw the sun setting and yeah. I realized that the sun sets every day. I was like, Whoa, <laughs> I just did that yesterday and the day before that's my first memory. Um, but this memory in Sunday school is very vivid too, where this lady's just going off and saying that, uh, that evolution is, is for scientists to trick you and, and make you do evil things. And so I thought yeah. that scientists were bad and I thought that evolution was bad. Uh, <laughs> I may have been there too, but just wasn't paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't. <clears throat> yes. People in the comments are like, are you guys twins? Are you brothers? Yes. We're, we're identical twins. It's if you missed the first few, few moments here, we're talking about our divergence, um, the divergence of our brains. We have the same brains technically uh, from a genetic perspective, but we've gone yeah. very different routes and that I am not religious. Mike is religious. And, uh, but uh, Mike is is interested in evolution is, is not doesn't see that as a conflict with his religious views so well real quick too um, I've heard you describe you know first thinking about the stuff by looking at our dog and yeah. I kind of went a different route with that like what was interesting to me about having a dog is just think about what the heck is it like for a dog to live with people like because we we act all different than yeah. than he does and he, he smells everything with his nose. We look with our eyes and feel with our hands. And he has to use his mouth. So that's what I was always thinking about with, with our dog. Mm -hmm. Whereas you were thinking about how his body's different. And, yeah. I don't know. So. Um, I, I got a question. Can you make a video about abiogenesis? Actually, next week, my guest is, <laughs> he's, he's a creationist <clears throat> who's arguing that abiogenesis is, uh, is garbage. And so we're actually going to do a little eh, debate, maybe just a discussion. I'm going to be talking about my, on, on the Stated Clearly channel, there's a whole series of videos I have on the origin of life. And um, he started writing me letters a while ago, um, complaining about those. <laughs> so I'm actually, I actually invited him on to talk about it. He's actually, he has a, he's a heart researcher. Um, so he, he's a scientist, but uh, yeah, I, I, it should be an interesting conversation next week. So yes, I will do a video here on Stated Casually about abiogenesis. Oh, we'll be talking about that at length and what it is that researchers have found in that, that field of research and, uh, you know, why it is that uh, I think that that research is awesome. But, and, and he'll be explaining why he hates it, but yeah, so that'll be that'll be fun next week. So come in and watch that, everyone. But that cool. yeah, let's get to our question, I suppose. Well, yeah. Unless anyone else has any other questions about being a twin, <laughs> um, and if you have questions, please do at stated casually uh, to start out your question, and that make sure to put that that break in there, the at stated. Uh, space casually and that will highlight your question so I can see it really easy in the comments I am horrible at reading questions and doing a live stream at the same time so um, I do not know Nephilim free no that's that's not ringing a bell um, let's see Does this virus survive in a home freezer? <laughs> that I don't know. I don't think so. I think that this virus gets killed when you freeze it um, because it's got a it's got a lipid membrane and that can easily tear. It's it's full of water. It's got a lipid membrane, and if you freeze it, it's probably going to break it. Um, but I actually haven't read anything about that. So, all right. So so Mike, your your question on on evolution. Let's. Yeah. So. Obviously, evolution comes from descent with modification. 
Um, I have six kids, which is unusual for a human and a modern human, I guess. Yeah. But even then, you know, I'm 37. I finally have six kids. Um, by the time my kids are having kids, it's going to be another, at least another five or six years, I hope. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so humans versus a virus, which is, you know, having offspring, I don't know, every couple hours or. Yeah. Uh, and same with bacteria. So. Basically, if we're in this arms race against all other creatures, we are like a virus and a bacteria can be super innovative compared to us. So how is it that we can, uh, I mean, how is it that it's so rare that we have these pandemics and mm -hmm. um, how can we even survive? So that's, that's been my question. Yeah. Yeah. So the answer, there, there's three big reasons for that. Like, why is it that it, it, it does seem like, uh, from our perspective that viruses should be able to just overtake us and cause our extinction, right? It seems like that, that would be what would happen when you have these things that can evolve so quickly because we see ourselves as being in competition with all these microbes, right? Um, uh, hold on. I just had a thought. Uh, another, another important thing to talk about in this... Um, I need to write down here. I came up with three three things to talk about, but there's actually a fourth that I should talk about. Um, this makes for great video right here as I'm writing my notes. Okay. So uh, the first thing to think about is that humans have been evolving. Well, our ancestors have been evolving alongside pathogens from the very start. And when I say from the very start, I mean from the, the time that we were single celled organisms, our ancestors were single celled mm -hmm. organisms. And so at one time, we also were evolving super quickly and reproducing super quickly, just like all these other uh, single-celled organisms and viruses are doing. Uh, viruses, viruses reproduce and evolve faster than bacteria. Bacteria evolve and reproduce faster than we do. And then you also got single-celled organisms like protists and so on that uh, evolve and reproduce slightly slower than viruses and bacteria. Uh, but a lot faster than us because they're single-celled. So our single-celled ancestors were protists. They were eukaryotes. Um, so they they were fairly complex single-celled organisms. They had uh, there was nuclei. They had nuclei. They had uh, mitochondria and all of this, all these complex adaptations. And if you don't know what any of that stuff is, that's fine. Um, this well from. When you read these, I kind of have a gist of it. So. Yeah. So we were single-celled organisms, fairly complex. Um, but in experiments with the the transition from single-cell to multi-cell today, because we, it's really hard to see in the fossil record what that, what that transition was like. So the only way that we can really know about that transition is through uh, comparative genetics. Uh, like we have all the same genes that protists have uh, we have different versions of them, but we have we have the same genes that they have. So from that, we can assume, you know, and just having a general understanding of evolution, we can assume that we were once single celled protists. And then through these experiments, uh, we can find what sorts of selection pressures, what sorts of environmental pressures gave rise to first colony formation. So these uh, individual organisms that are coming together to form colonies and those yeah. colonies cooperate with each other. And then true um, multi-celled reproduction where you have uh, as, as you know, one cell will be spit out to be a, one of the reproducers, you know, now we have sperm and eggs, the sperm and egg is fertilized to, to, to create a zygote. And that is the seed that gives rise to a whole multi-celled organism. Well, early on, you would have one cell leaving a colony and then growing and dividing and forming its own colony. And in those situations, uh, eventually, you know, early on, those colonies were all, all the individuals were identical in those colonies, but eventually you had cellular differentiation. So different cells would perform different tasks. And we start to see this in the fossil record, uh, before the Cambrian era, we start to see multi-celled uh, colonies and multi-celled organisms, and they're relatively simple compared to what we see today. They're, they're 
dramatically simple. And today we can actually see lots of uh, single celled organisms that form colonies. And we can, we can see single celled organisms or things that, are, that really blur the line between single celled and multi-celled. And when we study these organisms and when we do experiments in the lab on, on single celled organisms, we find that the, the big thing that causes them to, to start colonies and to start behaving more multicellular is they're trying to avoid some sort of a predator, some sort of, uh, of other single celled organism that's trying to attack them. And by joining forces in a colony, they can actually defend themselves against that enemy better. So right. the entire point of being multi-celled, we think like the, the reason this first evolved was because we wanted to defend ourselves better against pathogens. And being multi-celled helps you do this in several ways. First of all, you, you create these amazing barriers to, uh, to your enemies. So... Mm -hmm. On our cells, we we have uh, all sorts of proteins and sugars that we put on the outside of our cells. And some of the things that those do, some of those are de defense mechanisms. They make it harder for other organisms to get to the good parts that they're trying to eat. You know, every, everything's just trying to eat everything else, essentially. Yeah. Um, and so you can, you can build all these structures on the outside of your cell that help protect you. But you can also, if you are a multi-celled group, you can actually put dead cells on the outside of your colony to protect yourselves. You can, you can work together to produce uh, extracellular matrix uh, molecules. So you, you can produce together a whole bunch of stuff on the outside of your, of your colony. You can build a fort around your colony and that's what our cells do. Um, you can also do division of labor. So you can have some organism, some cells just start focusing strictly on building these protection molecules that go onto the outside of the body and other molecules or other, other cells become uh, warrior cells and they're, they fight any pathogen that gets in. And so all of their resources are, are devoted to fighting pathogens that come in. Whereas the other cells are devoting all their resources to, to building these these barriers that stop pathogens from getting in. And if you look at how our, our cells work, every cell in your body has its own set of your genome. So all of your genes, every single cell has its own set of your genes. And a bunch right. of them are turned off and a bunch of them are turned on. So the, the different cells that are doing different tasks, they have the same genome, just some of their genes are turned off where others are turned on and, and someone else. And that's what causes this division of labor. And the cells communicate with each other. They send uh, molecular signals to each other to uh, that, that cause the turning off and turning on of genes in their neighbors. And it's, it's a very complex coordination, how it works in something like us. But in these early uh, multi-celled organisms, it's fairly simple, you know, there's there's two types of cells in this colony. There's three types of cells. Now there's now there's 50. In, in humans, there's there's like hundreds of different types of cells. So right. uh, all of this is really, it started because we were trying to protect ourselves from these pathogens that can evolve super fast and are trying to kill us. So the, one of the big things is that from the very start, we've had this selection pressure and this selection pressure has never gone away. So all throughout the history of organisms that, that went from that, those single celled ancestors to us, all the hundreds of millions of years that have, that have gone by since then, these enemies have always been here with us and they've always been attacking us and anyone who was bad at fighting against them died. So we're actually super, super right. good at fighting these pathogens. And this is a surprise in science, because we didn't know that microorganisms existed until like this, I think it was the 1600s um, when we mm -hmm. started looking into microscopes and we discovered <laughs> the, uh, that microorganisms are a thing. So we were always just worried and impressed by what animals do in the normal world to fight each other and defend against each other. We had no clue that our bodies were so good at doing all these other things. And it turns out that you know, the reason you have phlegm in your throat, the reason you have oils on your skin, like all of these things are defenses. Uh, like 
their main function is to defend against pathogens. And right, that's the reason you get the fever, right? When you when you get yeah. sick. Yeah, yeah. A fever a fever does a couple of things. It, it it increases your body temperature, and so any pathogen that can't handle that temperature is going to die. But also, your immune system works better when you have uh, when you have the uh, a higher temperature because the the those immune molecules it, they can move faster. Temperature is just an increased amount of movement within molecules. And so a higher temperature loosens up their, uh, their membrane, their fatty membranes, just like when you, when you heat up uh, lard, it melts. Mm -hmm. um, when, you, when you slightly heat up a cell's membrane, it becomes more flexible and your immune cells, uh, that, that benefits your, your immune cells. They can do more. Um, so yeah, all of this extremely all these extremely complex systems have evolved to fight against pathogens and to protect against pathogens. And we talk about the immune system as if it's one thing, but it's not one thing. There are tons of different uh, <clears throat> systems that have evolved independently in our ancestors that we've inherited from them that are have evolved to fight different types of pathogens. So if we talk about the immune system, we have we've got all these barriers like our skin our skin is extremely difficult for any organism to penetrate our skin has uh all sor sorts of um molecules in its in its extracellular matrix so between cells there's a whole bunch of different types of proteins and uh sugars uh, when i say sugars i mean um, um sugar chains so these are things that are hard for microbes to digest if it was just like normal sugar like, like table sugar that'd be that'd be perfect like microbes love that that's what they eat that's what a lot of them eat but we have we have these sugar chains that are really hard to digest we have these uh these uh really complex proteins like collagen and there's a big mixture of it so if you if if you happen to evolve an enzyme that can digest collagen well you can get a little bit deeper into the skin but then there's another molecule and you need to, to evolve an enzyme for that too before you can you can really start getting in deeper so there's just right. massive well yeah well i was just gonna say at this point it seems like i mean a bacteria or a virus isn't trying to necessarily kill us anyways it's, it doesn't have that goal in mind it just wants to eat something and reproduce right. so yeah uh, so i understand kind of now now why why we have a good immune system against these things, but like, how did we ever get to the point where we could evolve um, so much better than everything else when we had to slow down our, our reproduction rate because we became more complex because we're, I mean, it'd be like if, if Google today stopped innovating, yeah, they didn't do yeah. any more. Innovation. And even though we have, you know, there's millions of small businesses that, they have no chance against Google to like, you know, consume Google. Yeah. But if Google were to stop today innovating yeah. um, and, and, you know, a virus is going to innovate, not, not twice as fast, not a hundred times fast, but like billions of times faster than we are because we're having children. Well, I mean, at this point we're having children. So, <laughs> so seldomly compared to what a virus is doing. So how yeah. do we get to that point? Well, it seems like early on in the process, it would be hard to get past that that you know maybe a multicellular stage and maybe it only happened once maybe it just happened once and then that's successful enough that it could knock off all the all the competing uh, microbes from then on but yeah so so actually we have um the the transition from single cell to multi multicellular has happened many times independently so plants are definitely a different version of multicellular cellular organism than humans are so the common ancestor between plants and animals was a single celled organism. So it, it, it's evolved multiple times. Uh, so there, there's a couple of things here. First of all, the ability for a single cell to innovate is actually limited by size. So, and, and the simplicity. So the viruses are so simple and they have to be so simple because of, of their, um, they've, they they can't they don't have a metabolism they have to transfer from one organism to another without somehow dying or breaking up in that time period 
um, and they, they become extremely simple. Most viruses are extremely, extremely simple, very small genomes. And so the amount of innovation that they're capable of is actually really small. They, they, they really can't innovate that much because their genomes are so small. And their genomes have to be small because they're not very good at replicating without breaking things. So they're, they have a much higher mutation rate than us, and it's a dangerously high mutation rate. And that's what keeps their genomes so small. That's one of the things that keeps their genomes so small. The, so there's just limited innovation you can do when you're that size. There's just right. limited, uh, a cell can only get so big before it breaks apart, um, a single cell. Uh, it, and it can only, it can only have a genome that's so large before it starts to just be extremely hard for it to survive and reproduce because it's got to maintain all of this giant uh, genome, which is really costly. And, you know, a cell can only pull th resources in for, at its surface so there's a there's a surface level problem, whereas you know we we are extremely efficient efficient in how we pull in food. We have parts of our bodies that are just for breaking down food. We got our teeth, we got our mouth, we get our stomach, and all this, and all of those cells are specialized in breaking down that food. But on top of that, you're saying that we we lo no longer innovate, and that is actually not true. Our immune system is extremely and it's constantly innovating, and actually it does so faster than any microbe can do because our immune system we have these things called b cells and the b cells are they are immune cells that will uh, they have proteins on that they produce called antibodies and these antibodies can bind to random molecules um, in the environment and when they bind to it uh, they can they can stop that molecule from functioning properly because now that this molecule has a giant protein stuck to it. And so it can't do what it was doing before. Um, if, if an antibody binds to a virus, for example, if a bunch of antibodies bind to a virus individual, that individual cannot do anything. It's, it's dead in the water. It's, it's, it's just surrounded by this coat of protein and it dies essentially. Um, these antibodies, um, uh, are rapidly produced through a, a hyper evolution process. So the B cell, when it when it is reproducing, it's it, there's actually a system in its genome that causes extremely fast mutations in the part of its genome that produces these antibody proteins. So when the cell re, is reproducing, and it, it reproduces in the bone marrow. That, that's where the the cells are produced. So, it, so there's evolution going on in us. Yeah. In, in the yeah. It's, we call it the adaptive immune system. And it mm -hmm. is during your lifetime, there's a group of your own cells that are undergoing hyper evolution. It's, it's a descent with modification program. And what so happens do I pass it on to my kids when I have a kid? No, no, you, you do not pass it on. So there's, there's, there's a bunch of immune cells that have evolved slowly and you actually do pass on, uh, what those immune cells will attack. So there's some immune cells that, and this is encoded in your genome that gets passed on from parent to child. And mm -hmm. they recognize virus DNA. There are certain markers on viral DNA that are, that are so common among viruses that we actually have encoded in our genome a way to attack them. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you pass that on to your kids. But there's, there's a, um, there's this secondary, the adaptive immune system, which you, during your lifetime, you become unique and, and the types of pathogens that you immediately recognize. So, but it is important to note that even without your adaptive immune system, you will still fight a virus. You, you will still kill a virus, most viral infections, but the adaptive immune system helps recognize them faster and helps produce these antibodies that will specifically attach to a virus. So even without a cell eating the virus, and actually fighting a virus particle, these antibodies will attach to it and just, it's dead in the water. It's, it cannot reproduce. Yeah. So there's this massive uh, rapid in innovation and it actually happens faster than any microbe can, can do because we have enzymes in our genome that actually cause random mutations in this specific part of this specific cell's genome. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really, really cool system. And we're not sure when it first started, but we know that all um, vertebrates, except 
Uh, almost all vertebrates have it. Some may have lost it. There's, a, I think, hagfish don't have it, I believe, the adaptive mm-hmm. immune system. But it seems to have evolved like at the start of vertebrate evolution. And different, you know, like mollusks and, and insects and so on, they have different ways of doing a similar thing. But, uh, you know, all vertebrates share this adaptive immune system process where we have these B cells and we have helper T cells and so on that that uh, help us produce these antibodies. So innovation is happening rapidly. And and that's possible because of division of labor. Um, so I guess those are two things. So first of all, we've been evolving with these pathogens from the start. So anyone who was bad at um, dealing with them would be dead. They're eliminated already. So we're actually like super professionals at dealing with pathogens. Secondly, we have this adaptive immune system. Third, uh, there's no pathogen that's just bent on eating humans and doesn't have any other thing to, be, to worry itself about. So all of the right. organisms that are living on your body and inside your body, they are in a constant war with each other as well. As uh, So they're just using you for resources. They're at war with your immune system. So all of your cells that are trying to fight them, they're at war with them. They're trying to eat. So that takes a lot of energy. Fighting your immune system takes a lot of energy. And then they have to fight all of their competitors, which takes a lot of energy. And uh, a lot of times you'll hear of people getting sick after taking antibiotics. So they're really sick. They take antibiotics. All goes well, but then they get sick again. And what's happened there is that the antibiotics have cleared out all of the species of bacteria that live in there, or most of the species of bacteria that were living in their intestines. And then one right. of them, one species ended up getting an upper hand as they were recolonizing. And, and because of that, you get sick again. <clears throat> Normally, the other microbes sort of act as your immune system because they're just competing for resources inside your intestines and on your skin and so on. So there's a, there's this, what Darwin called the tangled bank. You know, he didn't know about this insane, um, you know, competition going on inside your intestines, but he called, he, he talks about the, this tangled bank where everything is fighting with everything else. And it's actually pretty rare to see an organism that has an adaptation specifically for, just one other organism because we're all so busy fighting everything else um, at the same time. So that, that's the other, that's the other big thing. And again, these small microbes, they can only do so much. And so that they can only spend their energy doing, you know, fighting so many battles at, a, at one time. So they're really only able to do a little bit. I, I like to think of the, the microbes as, as you used the analogy to Google earlier. Um, yeah. The microbes would be like YouTubers, you know, or we're not even trying to we're not trying to take down Google. We're, we're using Google's YouTube platform to make a living for ourselves. We, we don't even care about killing Google like that's not on our agenda at all. And, you know, YouTubers have to compete with other YouTubers a little bit. We mostly just cooperate with each other. But um, so there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of. Uh, side competition that stops any pathogen from taking over a multi-celled organism. Yeah. Well, Am- Amazon's a good example too. Like anyone who sells on Amazon would like to, it would be great if, if they could consume a big chunk of Amazon, but no one really cares about that. They just want to beat out the, the other sellers selling similar products. So, right. Right. But yeah. Um, so I, I've got a couple of questions here. Yeah. Uh, one so Ann Smith says, I don't remember correct terminology, but our adapt- adaptations may be bigger and more sweeping to cover many issues. Um, well, one of the things that we do that viruses don't do so well is that we shuffle our genes. So every time that a human reproduces, we find a sexual partner um, and our genes shuffle. And that actually causes a lot of innovation. But mainly what it does is it as far as pathogens go, there's actually a lot of reasons that sexual reproduction is a benefit for complex organisms like ourselves. But one of the big things it does as far as microorganisms is the fact that your genes shuffled with your wife's genes means that your kids um, are different enough from both of you 
that a pathogen that can easily infect you cannot easily infect them. Their bodies are different enough that it's like, it's like a, a polar bear trying to colonize, um, like, you know, Southern California, right? Like they can do it, right? Maybe they could do it, but there's, it's just going to be, uh, it's going to be difficult, right? So, so our gene shuffling actually, um, you are right in that we're doing a lot less and like significantly less innovation evolu uh, along for, you know, from generation to generation because our generations take so long. Uh, but every time we reproduce, we have this, this kind of fake version of innovation where we're just, we, we shuffle our genes and we produce, we produce offspring that aren't quite like us, even though they might not have any beneficial new mutations. They have a weird shuffling of their parents' genes. Um, uh, Joe Bloggs asks, do mothers pass this adaptive immune response to children via breast milk? That, yes, I, I do recall having read that. And that was actually one of the, um, it's one of the, the concerns with, um, bottle feeding only is that you have, you have less, um, of this passing on of the immune system. <laughs> the, the other interesting thing about the immune system is that it'll actually try and kill a fetus so when one of the big reasons that it was so it's so hard for animals to evolve um something like a placental uh system like like mammals have is that the immune system is constantly trying to kill a fetus it sees it as a as a foreign pathogen and one of the adaptations that had to happen before uh we could evolve placentas is is that uh embryos had to evolve a signaling system that stops the immune system. And one of the interesting things about cancers is that, you know, all of our cells have this gene that stops the immune system from attacking a cluster of cells because we had that as fetuses. That was, it's what we use to defend ourselves against our mother's immune systems. All of our cells have that gene and a, a can't and cancer that can get turned back on. And so as the immune system is trying to attack a cancer cell, because our immune system does recognize cancer and tries to kill it, some cancers will turn that gene back on and they can avoid the, the immune system. So your immune system will start to attack it and think that it's a fetus and they'll leave it alone. Uh, so anyway, um, that, that's a weird side note there. But um, uh Subtracted asks, does the way humans select their mates based on sexual selection? Um, yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah humans are definitely do doing sexual selection. We, we're very careful when we pick our mates. And we actually, there is some evidence that um, one thing that makes someone attractive is their immune system. Uh, there, there are theories that we actually pick up on through smells, um, how compatible someone else's immune system might be with us before we we want to mate with them and mm -hmm. i don't know how much uh, online dating screws that up but uh, uh some people are also worried that um birth control pills might screw that up because the um hormones involved in that are affected by birth control so there's uh, that's kind of an interesting field of research that i'm not very expert in at all but i have read things like that. So anyway, do uh, you have any questions about that so far? So the immune system, the competition between pathogens, and then, you know, our evolution from single cell to multi-cell. Well, so, okay, we have a multi-celled organism, but it's still small and reproduces fast. Yeah. What, what allowed it to start even expanding more? Because obviously the bigger it gets, the slower it reproduces. I, I would assume yeah. the bigger produces what was it that was it that ability for it to have some cells that can be adaptive is that what made us able to actually uh, and because we we reproduce so much slower yeah. than these, yeah and if, if descent is really the only way we can adapt is that was that what happened or do we even know or is it just um well once once you have a really stable defense against pathogens so maybe let's just say no, no adaptiveness. You just have really good barriers. So you, you can produce a super awesome cell, um, cell coatings that nothing can get through or almost nothing can get through. 
Well, now, now there's no selection pressure from viruses, right? Or there's very little. So other, other selection pressures in the environment are going to start to be more impactful. So maybe you need a, maybe there's a big food source that you could get. Maybe there's other multi-celled organisms in your environment that if you could just break them apart and swallow them, <laughs> you would be yeah. super rich. You, you'd hit the jackpot. So, and so maybe we start, start evolving to attack those things instead of the small things. Right. Once we have that. Right. We've, once there's a certain level of mastery, it's not perfect mastery of dealing with pathogens. We start dealing with other things that are also have also done the same mastery. And so, so we're constantly competing. We're competing with everybody, right? There's, there's competition with every other organism and there's cooperation, um, opportunities for cooperation with other, other colonies and stuff too. It's not all just, um, eating everything else. There's cooperation is a big thing in, in biology, but the uh, once there's sufficient mastery of dealing with other single-celled organisms, you've got these multi-celled organisms around you too, and you can exploit them in different ways. And so there's all sorts of competitions that go on for, for increased body size um, that have nothing to do with pathogens. And if at any time throughout evolutionary history, um, a, a multi-celled organism uh, ended up getting too complex and too weak towards pathogens, it went extinct. So um, right. we are, we've, we've just gone through this incredible gauntlet, you know, and we are what came out the other side of that. Uh, and us and all other multi-celled organisms that you see around yourself, the, the grass in, in your front yard and the, um, your mm -hmm. dog and all of us, we're these winners in this crazy battle. Um, So the last thing that I want to, to bring home is, is something that you mentioned too, is that there's actually not a pathogen that wants to kill us. That's not, there's not, nothing's actually trying to do that in the first place. They're just trying to make a living and a virus can't tell that you're an organism. <laughs> it, 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 it can only tell that you're some proteins and that it can bind to. And after it binds to them, it can start to reproduce and, you know, I mean, obviously a virus has no knowledge of anything. It doesn't have a brain or anything like that. But it's nothing is trying to kill us. Things are just trying to survive and reproduce. So right. um, there's there's no organism that has a project to take us down, right? Except for mm -hmm. other large predators, like a tiger <laughs> might have a project to take someone down, right? Yeah, but, it's going to eat us. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, a pathogen, that's not, that's not on its to-do list. So, well... And and that's why um, it's really the pathogens that come from other animals that are dangerous, right? Because it, it's it's adapted to living in a pig or a bat or a chicken, and obviously it doesn't want to kill that chicken. It wants to that chicken to pass it on to another chicken to another chicken. But then all of a sudden it ends up in our immune system, and it doesn't know how to deal with our immune system, and so it doesn't know how to deal with our body, so it ends up killing us, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you, you're using the word no there in a yeah, abstract right. sense. But yes, because yeah, because because the virus doesn't know anything, but it's adapted to. So yeah, so uh, the other thing, because because these viruses are not trying to kill us, their innovation is going to be uh, the rapid evolution evolution that they're capable of, and the innovation that they're going to uh, come up with is. Um, innovations towards surviving and reproducing better within their host species. And almost always that means not hurting your host species too much, because if you hurt your host species too much, you cannot spread to a new host. Um, right. So when a virus has been with a host for a long time, it's almost always benign. And it, it's very gentle to its host because mm -hmm. it wants its host to be healthy and interact with other members of the spe of its own species and pass that virus to other members of its own species. But you're right, when, when a jump happens, when you go from one species to another, uh, the adaptations of gentleness are not there yet. And so a lot of times a, vir a new virus will be extremely deadly. You know, Ebola we see is extremely deadly, right. where Ebola in bats, Ebola comes from bats too. And in mm -hmm. bats, it doesn't seem to be that big of an issue for them. So it's, and HIV does the same thing with chimpanzees. A lot of chimpanzees who have, who have the chimp version of HIV, 
they're not really bothered by it or they don't seem to be like they can mm-hmm. they just like we can sometimes get sick from uh microbes that normally live in our intestines if we have if we get stressed out in some way uh, i think there is evidence that sometimes chimps will get uh, a version of aids from their from their version of hiv so they'll actually get sick from from the virus but in most cases they just carry it and it's just it just lives with them and with the coronavirus um, there's a bunch of different coronaviruses that humans already have we have four of them that circulate through our population that don't hurt us at all it's like well they can if you're old you can die from it but um, common cold is what it causes right so it's really those those things combined um, that make it so that we are really we don't usually have to worry about pathogens like I mean we we worry a little bit about them we wash our hands and you know we have hygiene rules and stuff but if you look at if you if you look at these uh, like uh, I just watched a video Marilyn and I were watching a documentary about uh, these people in I think it was in it was somewhere in Africa they live in a in a junkyard and they just all they do is they scavenge for scraps in the junkyard like pieces of metal that you can sell that people someone threw away yeah. these people live in garbage like literally mm-hmm. live in garbage they're never clean and their immune systems are just insanely robust and they do just fine and it's it's amazing how oh. <laughs> how adaptive we are and of course there's mm-hmm. strong selection pressure going on there they they're living and reproducing in the in the garbage heaps um so their their kids they have a super high mortality rate for their offspring right you know they're having like 10 kids and maybe two will will survive to be an adult so um yeah we we're extremely good at fighting pathogens uh i've got a couple of questions in the comments here Uh, do you have anything else to say on that or questions oh uh, the only other question kind of related to that well it's not directly related but just thinking about how fast these things uh, reproduce compared to us. I was wondering, do we have, and, and you kind of answered this with our immune system that, that kind of does hyper evolution, but are mm-hmm. there any creatures that have in their genome um, the ability to mutate? Like I say on purpose, I know they're not thinking about yeah, doing yeah. this, but that makes them mutate at a higher percentage than just the average error rate and reproducing so like is is there is there a dna sequence that says you know every every third offspring you have i'm gonna mess up its dna on purpose um yeah so we there there is something similar to that in even in humans and actually in most plants and animals uh and it's Maybe it's an adaptation, but a lot of people say it's not an adaptation. So what it is, is we have we have these things called jumping genes that cause they're genes that are constantly trying to make copies of themselves inside of our own genomes. So they're you can kind of think of them as parasites that live inside of us. And we have a bunch of resources that our cells dedicate to stopping them from reproducing. So they're actually genes in our genome. We pass them from parent to child. Uh, but we think of them, a lot of people think of them as pathogens. Like they're, we actually think that some of them came from viruses. So they started out as a virus and the virus has atrophied into just this jumping gene. And so it's trying to, it's trying to make more copies of itself in each one of our cells. And, and all it is, is a stretch of DNA that codes for a protein that allows it to make copies of itself. We've got a bunch of resources dedicated to stopping that from happening. But when you're stressed, extremely stressed, like you're starving, for example, you simply can't make the proteins that our body uses to stop those jumping genes from doing what they do because the resources aren't there. And so the jumping genes start to reproduce more and they start to cause mutations. And so there is actually this weird um, feedback loop where if you're extremely stressed out, you you get more mutations and then you pass those mutations on to your offspring. And in humans, that's usually bad. We have a very controlled mutation rate. So we've evolved a mutation rate that's, uh, that's sustainable. The more complex your genome is, the, 
the more likely it is for a mutation to be bad than good. Does that make sense? Right. It's yeah. like, it, <laughs> one of the things I like to say about this is, um, if you drill a hole in a skateboard, if you just take a random drill, drill press and make a, a random hole in a skateboard, most likely the skateboard's going to be fine. But if you make a random hole in a motorcycle, you can easily break it, right? Or a person. <laughs> yeah, or a person. So uh, the more complex a system is, actually, the more fragile it is in a way. It has to be more more protective. A virus, yeah. a virus mutates extremely fast, and ha- and a lot of viruses have no enzymes that slow down their mutation rate. Humans have lots of enzymes that slow down our mutation rate so that we can evolve at a slower pace still. So it's the, the, the problem is actually higher than, than you were originally thinking. Cause you were thinking that the only thing that makes us evolve slow is our re- slow reproduction rate. But we also have these really um, complex systems that slow down our actual mutation rate. However, our genomes are huge. So we, mm-hmm. there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more opportunity for innovation there. Um, okay. I don't know if I answered your question or if I just went on a tangent. Yeah. Okay. So we have a couple of questions. One, one is about being a twin. That's kind of funny. John, if you and Mike married a pair of identical twin sisters and had children, then would the children of you all be identical as well? Um, they wouldn't be identical, but they would be the same as being our children. So, so there would be, if you tested his kids genomes versus my kids genomes. Yeah. 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 He's got a bunch, he's got, he has six kids that are stirring, (laughs) but so if you, if identical twins marry another set of identical twins, all of their kids, instead of being cousins, they would be genetically, they'd be siblings. So, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell that they were cousins by doing a genetic test. A genetic test would say that they are siblings, not cousins. So that's, that's kind of interesting. And growing up, we, there was a set of identical twins that we were friends with. And it, it was always kind of like, we, we talked about that some, uh, at one point. Um, but you know, we, we just weren't that into them. I wasn't, uh, you know, KD and Alice, if you're watching, what's up? It was fun growing up with you guys, having identical twin sisters that were hanging out with us. That was really cool. Um, let's see. And Smith says, strong immune systems need to be exercised. Yes, that's very true. Um, uh, Foppish wants us to talk about quorum sensing and bacteria. Quorum sensing and bacteria is, uh, I'd have to pre- prepare a whole lesson on that. That'd be for another day. Um, Subtracted asks, what do you think the ancestor of humans and chimpanzees would have looked like? So we have a bunch of fossils of uh that date back to the split between humans and chimps. And we can't tell if one is like the ancestor of humans and chimps. It's, it's, it's very difficult when, when you're looking at fossils, but the, at that time, the fossils were very chimp like, so they, they looked very much more chimp like than human like. And once humans and chimps split, the human line ended up becoming more and more human like and chimps stayed fairly similar. I mean, Obviously, their behavior and all sorts of things were changing about them, but um, they still look fairly similar. So, uh, oh, thank you. I got a super chat. Why, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm back. Cool. We were, um, we, we were just talking about um, Katie and Alice. <laughs> and, and uh, yeah. yeah, we didn't, we didn't. Neither of us married Katie nor Alice. They didn't want to marry us and we didn't want to marry them, but we were good friends with these identical twins uh, growing up. And that was, that I, I believe that conversation came up once. I seem to remember that conversation coming up. Like if if we were to both marry, one of us were to marry Kate and the other one Alice, our kids would be siblings, not cousins, which is, it's pretty funny. Yeah. Well, well also, uh, another weird thing about being a twin is like, 
if you were to test my kid's DNA, you would be the father as much as I am. Yeah. I mean, our DNA has probably changed a little bit from since we were born. I, I mean, aren't there, aren't there minor changes that happen over time that you can detect? Yeah. Yeah. So there probably, um, so if you actually were to sequence our entire genomes, yes, you could definitely find um, differences, but right. it would be extremely difficult. All the tests that we use now for normal, like father tests and so on, like those would not mm -hmm. detect it. Those, those would, those would say that we're, we're siblings, mm -hmm. but yeah, as soon as you have cell division, you, you start to get mutations and right. any mutation that happened really early on. So, you know, there was a point when we, when you were just eight cells big, and any mutation that happened in one of those cells would then be in one eighth of your body as, as you matured. So right. uh, probably if you were to, if you were to sequence the genomes of all of your, all of our cells and average them together, we'd saw the average would be identical between you and I, mm -hmm. but uh, there are ways to tell um, even identical twins apart with genetic, genetic testing. Yeah. So if I, if I, uh, if I murder someone or something, my DNA is on the scene. They yeah. could differentiate my DNA from yours if they really looked deep into it. Yeah, I think I think it's only happened once where they had to go that deep in a murder case because because the, there was there was identical twins and they were blaming each other for it and so they had to um, they had to use this new. I, I don't know if it actually actually I think that man it's things that you read and then you never I, I don't even know where where it happened or um, but I think that case got thrown out because of this. And, and that inspired a company to actually make a test that could tell identical twins apart, which mm -hmm. has ne then never been used, <laughs> right? Um, so it's, it's I, certainly possible. Uh, iPhone space identity recognition does not, I, I don't think it would recognize the difference between us. I know Facebook doesn't. I'm yeah, always yeah. getting tagged in posts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's, there's pictures of, of my wife, like, kissing me, and it tags Mike in it. And, you know... <laughs> People are like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> I remember, uh, I remember when um, there was a funny story about that. Um, when you were, I was at Costco one time uh, with my girlfriend at the time, and my girlfriend, who was obviously not your wife, and mm -hmm. uh, someone from your church came up and said, "Hello, Brother Perry," and super concerned because I'm with this woman. And we're, we're at Costco buying Costco groceries. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I was like, I, I just said hello. And I kept walking because I didn't know if I knew him because um, like if he and, and then later I was thinking, oh, man, he thinks I'm Mike and he thinks that I'm like with some other woman. <laughs> that's that's kind of funny. So I don't know if you well, ever heard back from that. I, I didn't hear. No one talked to me about that. But my my next door neighbor once she approached me and I was like. I thought this was really awesome that she had that, you know, the, <laughs> I don't know, she's brave enough to approach me about this. <laughs> it, like, I was getting out of my car when she came up to me. She's like, Mike, I saw you with another woman yesterday. <laughs> and I was like, oh, and I described your girlfriend. I'm like, is it this? And she's like, yes. And I'm like, oh, that, that was my twin brother. She's like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she believe you? I, yeah, she believed me. But I... <laughs> I just thought it was it was funny that uh, it was cool that she would approach me about it instead of like going to Amy or like you know <laughs> or, or not saying anything at all. I, I thought, that, but it was pretty funny. And <laughs> it used to be like a year within a year after you worked at Costco, I would still go in there and people would be like, "Chime!" and you know I yeah. get hugs from the old lady at the at the the counter and stuff. I'm like, ah. Oh. <laughs> you i i don't know who you are but uh, you probably know my brother <laughs> so yeah yeah good times and uh we could always uh swap um driver's licenses or or uh passports or whatever we need to so yeah 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 push comes to shove <laughs> yep maybe we shouldn't stream about our plans to avoid <laughs> <laughs> incarceration on live youtube but no, um, the uh, I, I'm getting a bunch of questions out here. Um, some some things about twins. I got um, well. Joe Bloggs asked maybe maybe we already covered this. Um, could a crime lab tell which of you did it? Yes, that technology now exists to tell, um, but it did not in the past, in the recent past. Um, Siddharth asks, 
uh, I just read that identical twins have a higher probability of having identical twins as well. I have heard that too. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't know how, I don't know how intense that those statistics are. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's a question for you. I don't know if you know yeah. the answer to it, but, um, Amy was reading about, um, Oh, one of the plagues, I think it was the Black Plague, that mm -hmm. after the Black Plague, historians say there is an unusually high rate of twins, like fraternal twins. Mm -hmm. I don't know I don't know how good their statistics were back then, but is that possible that that could be in our genome, that after there's a, a big extinction event that we have um, a higher reproductive rate from twins? I, it's possible, but <laughs> that would be a... That would be a that's a pretty sophisticated adaptation that's not used very often. So it seems very unlikely that something like that would maintain selection advantage over time because yeah. an ability like that, that's triggered during a pandemic, like that seems super unlikely. Um, so it, it, it may be like one of those things where, yeah. you know, you buy, buy a Ford Taurus and all of a sudden you see Ford Tauruses everywhere. Right. You, you right. go through this big, thing and then all of a sudden you, you kind of start noticing there's twins so and, and you just it's just uh you can have a coincidence i mean there's mm -hmm. weird coincidences happen all the time but in order for a trait like that to exist there would have to be some sort of sensory mechanism that communicates with <laughs> reproductive organs that there was a pandemic and i mean right. there's weird things that have evolved but that seems that seems too weird to me for that for that to exist but maybe i mean oh, if, it's possible if Other someone possible. if someone were to find a mechanism for it but the reason i don't think that that's possible is because pandemics are so rare and they were even more rare in ancient history because their populations weren't very big so i think it'd be really weird that we have an adaptation a complex adaptation for pandemics that that would be weird um oh uh Go ahead and answer a few more questions, but I got I've got one more for you. So okay, well, let me yeah, let me go through a couple more of these. P people are asking if if our fingerprints are the same. They're not the same. Uh, no, nope. fingerprints are uh, developed. They're, they're not. It's not just the genes that that like handcraft each fingerprint. There's a uh, there's a lot of interplay between uh, the environment and the genome as fingerprints are being being developed. Um. So the environment in the womb, that is, like how much nutrients and when you're getting nutrients and all, all sorts of things. Right. Um, hey, John, after all of your years of studying evolution, does it even freak you out that we're just talking primates? <laughs> yes, it especially freaks me out when I realize that we have nuclear weapons and we can we can genetically engineer other organisms and so on. I, I say oftentimes that we are chimps with smartphones um, where we really... Uh, we have these really basic animal instincts at the base of a lot of our desires, and we've given ourselves incredible power through uh, technology and innovation that's actually really dangerous in our hands. So that, that actually does freak me out for several reasons. Uh, let's see. Are your eyes distinguishable too? Uh, probably. I mean, our eyes are the same color, but um, yeah, if you were to look at them close up, they definitely have different markings in them. Well, even even like our head shape and our nose shape is going to be a little bit different. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and let's we'll see who's going bald faster. I'm I'm definitely balding fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's all sorts of my, things that. <laughs> um, also, my daughter cut my hair. My six year old daughter cut my hair, but but even if it wasn't for that, I, I would. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. We're, we're both going bald but mike has six kids so i think it, it's happening a little faster for him <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit fatter um i'm i think i'm about an inch shorter than you so oh, you're shorter than me you were taller than me as we're, when we were growing up but uh, that's interesting yeah um yeah i uh, i some friends of mine they were identical twins there's like a almost a foot difference in height and it's because one of them got really sick when she was like right going through a growth spurt at young age. There's tons of things um, that change uh, identical twins. Well, you had, you had Guillain-Bray syndrome. Isn't that genetic or was that? 
No, uh, no, it's a, it's an autoimmune disorder. So the immune system thought that a protein on my nervous system was a bacteria, probably a bacteria is probably what I thought it was. And so it's attacking it. And that's, that's part of the, that's the adaptive immune system. So okay. that's, that's something that happened. Um, there's a lot to talk about <laughs> the adaptive immune system. It's super cool how it works when a B cell is creating antibodies. It does so in the um, in the bone marrow first, and if it mm -hmm. creates an antibody that binds to anything in the bone marrow, it's immediately killed, because in the bone marrow you excrete every protein that your body makes. Every protein is excreted in the bone marrow, and if an antibody connects to any one of those, the cell that made that is immediately killed, um, and that's mm -hmm. that's what makes it so that your immune system c can do this random evolutionary process that allows it to attach to anything except for your own cells. But in the case of Guillain-Barre, there was a screw up there. And one of these cells that uh, could attack a protein in my nervous system somehow got loose. It didn't get killed. It made it out into the bloodstream and it somehow got activated to reproduce. And so it was, it was launching a massive attack on my nervous system and I was paralyzed for, um, it's happened when I was 18 years old. Um, I, I was paralyzed for like, I was a quadriplegic for like two weeks. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. And then that I got, crazy. then I got better. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, a lot of people, by the way, don't recover fully from that. I was just super lucky. Mm -hmm. Um, did you both start off as creationists, uh, rejecting evolution? I, so actually, according to Mike, he never really was. So Mike is a creationist in the sense that he believes in a creator because he's a Christian. I am not religious, so I, I am not a, cre a creationist even in the, the light sense of the word. But I was a creationist in the hard sense of the word in that I rejected evolution when I was a young kid because I was told to by my Sunday school teacher. And Mike somehow never got that message. So he never he never was a creationist in the hard sense. I actually was. Um, mm -hmm. And I am now, eh, I guess you could consider me atheist. I'm not religious. Um, and Mike would be soft creationist, I guess you could say, because he believes in a creator. Um, are you okay with that label? <laughs> sure. <laughs> in that context, put it in a proper context. Um, is it possible in the future to grow opposite sex, sex organs, like growing kidneys for transplant? Uh, yeah, probably. Um, you could... We're going to be doing all kinds of weird stuff in the laboratory that's <laughs> fascinating and wonderful and disturbing. Uh, do you think that most kids in the future will be produced via IVF? That's what um, uh, the, the artificial insemination or the um, um, test tube babies. Um, I don't know. Possibly. I mean, that's, that's like a form it of, uh, on it depends on how culture evolves. There's no way to yeah. predict that. Yeah. Um, so what you can do is you can, you can have fertilization take place in a test tube instead of, uh, naturally. And you do that so that you can screen sperm that have bad mutations <laughs> and scream e screen eggs that have bad mutations. And then you take that zygote and immediately implant it into the, the uterus. Um, so it's still being raised in the uterus in, in, in most of these cases. I think in all of the cases right now, um, <laughs> we are getting to the point where you can raise. Uh, there, there's this sheep that was raised in a plastic sack, so it was an artificial um, womb, and that is not being used on humans yet. But that could be a thing in the future. But yeah, so the you know the IVF. That's what you're doing there is you're screening for bad mutations. So if you know that you carry a genetic disease, uh, but it's, you, you can actually have your, your sperm screened for it. Um, so the ones that don't happen to carry that disease can be used instead of the ones that do. So yeah, that just makes it much less tragic to do, go the, the old way, which is you just trial and error. You have, some of your kids have the disease and some don't. Mm -hmm. 
what type well, of environmental selection pressures selected for intelligence in our evolutionary history? <laughs> That's another really complex uh, story for a whole video on some other day. But you're going to say something, Mike? Oh yeah, I was, I was just going to say like it'll be it would be interesting to look a thousand years into the future and see what things are like because we've never had technology jump yeah. forward this much, and there's no way to tell what our culture is going to say is okay and what's not okay and yeah, yeah. so be, but. yeah and things are changing so rapidly now that people are <laughs> I mean it could be a hundred years from now and we don't recognize our species it, it it could be it could be insane I mean we could. Like Elon Musk yeah. is trying to connect the nervous system with computers, like directly. Uh, <laughs> right. the, this is insane. If if this if this happens, it could dramatically change what humans are like within like ten years. You know, it could it could really <laughs> cause major problems, or just yeah, the future is very. Thinking about the future is super weird. You know. Well, even right now, if you talk to someone a hundred years ago, they would have more. Well, maybe 200 years ago, they'd have more in common with someone a thousand years ago than they would have with us because like culturally, you know, 200 years ago, they were still using um, animals for everything and, um, you know, horses and stuff. Yeah. So in just 200 years, we've changed so much as a species and a culture. So there's no way there's no way to predict. Yeah, but, it, is, it is quite spectacular. And Smith says, I don't think believing in a creator makes you a creationist. Uh, theist versus creationist so you're right in that the way that people usually use the word creationist they're talking about people who reject evolution because they are um, christian or um, muslim so they reject evolution because of their belief in a creator but when, when i say a light creationist I mean, if you believe in christianity by default you believe that that God is is a creator, so you are technically a creationist. I mean, uh, you are you technically believe in a creator. So it's all it's all semantics. But. Yeah, but you know, yeah. language is. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't be calling someone a light creationist if they believe just in that way because it can cause confusion. But yeah, it's it's really just uh, you know. A I, I of, believe there's. A God, so. yeah. yeah, yeah. Mike believes there's a God. I. Um, don't see reason to believe that and so the that's that's the big difference between mike and i um, hey john in the two hundred thousand years of anatomically modern humans existing why haven't we speciated yet uh humans are not going to speciate because uh well so I guess there's 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 kind of there's two types of speciation. There's speciation that happens when there's a population split, and the two populations are under very different selection pressures. That's how most speciation happens. But also you can get what equates to speciation if just the selection pressures everywhere change, and so you have just one population, and that whole population changes. And so when you look at the fossil record, uh, you recognize a different species when you look back in time, even though there was no splitting. I can't remember the name of that type of. St There's specific words for these, and I'm I'm blanking on them right now. But um, the reason that we are not speciating in in the last two hundred thousand years is because our populations are just not splitting enough for um, like there's gene flow between all populations uh, within the human species, and so we really can't change that much because we're all kind of intermixing and passing genes from one to another, you know, genes from Europe, make it to Asia. Um, and they were doing that actually long before we had international flights and stuff just through people mating with their neighbors. You get gene flow throughout the entire population. It's, it's slower gene flow in the past than it is now, but it was, it was happening. So you don't get well, speciation. Well, also because our brains have evolved to where we can adapt to live anywhere, there's no need to really um, right, right. make large decisions. I don't, I don't need to grow fur. I can just put on a coat. Yeah, yeah. we, we adapt culturally more than we do uh, biologically at this point. And actually, that's another good point, too, with Mike. You're, you're saying, you know, that that is another form of how we adapt is we, we adapt behaviorally. And, uh, right. and that's a super huge advantage. Um, well, yeah, right now I've, 
in Oregon, we've been in lockdown for over 30 days, so we're adapting to fight this coronavirus. Right. Uh, we're just adapting our behavior to fight it. Oh, uh, uh, Catherine Fix corrected me, saying Elon Musk is funding part of the, the Neuralink project. He's not working on it. So, yeah, you're right. He's funding it, and um, he, he saw it as an important project. And he argues that it, he thinks that AI will eventually... Um, uh, is there's a huge threat from AI if it gets good enough. There's a huge threat of AI actually just ruining everything. And he thinks that if we're actually physically connected to it, that we could actually stop that. That's, that's the best way to stop AI from ruining everything. So that's interesting. Yeah, he, <laughs> he thinks if we're part of it, then our will will be its will, so it won't desire to mess us up, right? Yeah, which... I I think I haven't watched, <laughs> I mean, lot, but that's the gist of what I, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know, who's will, <laughs> whoever happens to be hooked to it, it gets, gets to play God, I suppose. So that, that could be horrible. Um, so let me, let me just do like two or three more. Let me do three more. Um, questions and then Mike, if you have any more any question that you think of too, we we can talk about that. Do you feel like it was this was satisfying for your um, your curiosity on pathogens too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, let's see. Siddharth asks, uh, well, or comments. Neuralink is really cool, but do you think that the next step of that could be where we ditch the hardware? Uh, we search for something, and the search result appears in the mind. Uh, well, I mean, I suppose that's, that's where we're at right now, right? Um, where we have, uh, oh, I think, I think what you're asking is, you know, right now we have to have these implants into the brain. And are you saying, could we be connected without an implant directly into the brain? Probably, uh, that would, I mean, our brains are constantly producing, uh, uh, signals that can be picked up, uh. So if we could develop a machine that could read those signals perfectly, you could actually be connected through it, I guess you could say, um, kind of through, through Wi-Fi, I suppose. Something similar to Wi-Fi. You could be connected to a computer where your mind could be connected to a, to a computer, maybe. <laughs> I mean, the best way to do it, the most direct way to do it would be to actually have a wire going into your brain. But of course, most people don't want that to to be a thing that they have in their head. Um, and Smith asks, God can create by using the method of evolution, or says, um, yeah, yeah, I suppose. Um, I mean, the, the word God is so undefined that God can do anything, right? <laughs> God could be anything. God could be a giant purple peacock um, that sneezes out living things. It, I mean, God, God could be anything. Uh, because we don't we don't know what God is, right? I don't know. Maybe you have a different opinion on that, Mike. <laughs> um, well, I I would say uh, it's hard to define God, but Jesus Christ is said to be His, um, you know, the visible manifestation of God. So within within Christianity, uh, you can understand the character at least from looking at Jesus Christ. But but yeah. Within Christianity, of course, every other religion has yeah. their different god. Right, within Christianity. So, uh, let's see. If we have mated with Neanderthals and produced fertile offspring, then isn't the definition of species incorrect, or doesn't doesn't exactly apply to us? And Mike was actually asking. We were talking about this before the show, so that's a, that's a good question because I have this lovely. Uh, let, me, let me show the my starting soon. My my thumbnail to this video is this creepy looking neanderthal <laughs> i love i love this picture it's like uh, the funniest neanderthal sculpture ever it's a re first of all it's really good art but the, just the pose is hilarious um so yes our ancestors thought that this 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 guy was was cute and um mated uh and w and we did produce successful offspring with with neanderthals there's a bunch of genetic evidence that europeans mixed with neanderthals at one point uh, so there is this species concept in biology saying that, um, 
a species is a a group that can have successful offspring you know with other members of that same group so if you can have successful offspring it's that's considered a species if you cannot they're considered two different species and because neanderthals and humans could mate doesn't that mean we're just one species well this species definition it breaks down at the fuzzy borders uh when when a species is first splitting it, they can merge again and there's this there's this kind of no man's land when you're you're not really a fully divided species and then eventually you are uh, you know there's you know if, if a frog and a bat were to try to have a baby it would not work <laughs> right their genes are not compatible but if a um you know two species uh, or two different populations of bat uh, might be able to mate lions and tigers can produce ligers right so there is as a lot all, of yes 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 as we all now know from tiger king yeah yeah I, I always thought that ligers couldn't have offspring but apparently they can so uh, some of them some of them i think they can and but if it doesn't happen in the wild <clears throat> So the, if, if they're not willing to wrap, you know, easily reproduce in the wild, we consider them to be different species. And it's yeah. really, it really just becomes semantics at this point. It's like you're drawing a line in the sand and uh, there's reasons to do it. Um, to, to just draw a line in the sand, but it causes problems when you have these cases like humans and Neanderthals. We could mate. We probably didn't mate very often. In fact, there's, there's, there's evidence to suggest that we didn't mate very often at all. So it happened, but it wasn't very common. And sometimes when it would happen, viable offspring would be the result. But there's this, this is happening right now with the spotted owl and the barred owl in Oregon. Uh, spotted owl and barred owls are mixing and they're producing hybrid offspring. And the hybrid are horrible at surviving, usually. They, they're not, they do not do well. And they're really bad at attracting mates and stuff. So it's, um, we're, they can produce, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They, they can produce offspring, but it just doesn't work that well. And that was probably what was happening with humans and Neanderthals. I mean, just just imagine that context now um, with like the racism that would exist between these two groups or that could exist between these two groups. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm thinking about a Chihuahua and a St. Bernard. They could probably mate, but I don't know how often that would happen naturally <laughs> yeah and actually when that happens there's t there can be major health problems if, if two dog breeds that are very different size mate a lot of times mm -hmm. the mother will die if, if the mother was small the baby can kill her because it's too big um i mean it, it can work but it's super dangerous like uh you don't you do not want your small dog mating with a large dog um mm -hmm. if, if your dog is female uh <laughs> We're going deep. We're going deep in the comments today. Where, where do you think consciousness came from? <laughs> Again, that's another topic for another day. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think that's that wraps things up here. We're, we're well, we're almost coming up at uh, twelve thirty my time. What is it? Uh, Eleven thirty or what time is it over there? <laughs> Nine thirty. Um, I'm on my phone. The clock's up. I think it's like nine thirty. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, let's see. I'm trying to see if there's anything else we, I should talk about here. People, there, there's been, we've got a conversation on AI here now. Um, Sam asks, will mammals ever evolve to breathe water? That's a super cool question. So, um, let me end it by talking about that question. That's, that's a super fun question. So we've got whales that live in the ocean and they can drown because they live in the ocean. And you would think that there would be this tremendous selection pressure for them to evolve gills or some, something like that. But it turns out that breathing air is actually way better than breathing oxygen in the, in the water because you can just get way more of it. So for animals with a really high metabolism, like mammals, like the fact that we already breathe air, it's, it actually puts whales at a huge benefit to a lot of other fish, um, you know, to other animals that live in the ocean. And that's actually why whales can get so big. The fish, the, the largest fish is the whale shark. It's not actually a whale. It's a shark. Sharks are fish. 
and it's dwarfed by the largest whales, you know. And the reason for that is that oxygen is needed for cellular metabolism. And breathing oxygen from the air is way more efficient than trying to pull it out of the water. And you actually have a lot of fish that breathe air as well. Um, there's a lot, there's lungfish, for example. They actually have a primitive lung. And we think that lungs actually first evolved in fish so that they could breathe air in stagnant waters. Um, they could pull in air. So uh, it's unlikely that mammals will evolve to breathe water, oxygen from the water directly because we have this wonderful lung system. But there is an example in turtles where this is happening. The Fitzroy River turtle can breathe water through its butt. <laughs> and uh, that was actually the first live stream that I did was about this. So if you go back um, to Sunday Morning Science and try and look at Sunday Morning Science episodes on the Stated Casually channel, you'll find a whole lesson on that the anatomy of butt breathing in turtles. And so these turtles have lungs, which they breathe air with, but they can also breathe through their butt and they can breathe indefinitely through their butt. They don't have to get air. And this is possible in turtles where it would not be possible in mammals because their metabolism is so much slower than ours. Um, um, and there's a bunch of other uh, reasons, but yeah, it's highly, un it's possible that, that could evolve in mammals, but it's highly unlikely. But it's definitely possible that, that, I mean, it is happening in reptiles. So <laughs> there you go. Um, with that. <laughs> Sounds like your dogs uh, are. Yeah, my, my dogs are. I think Marilyn just, she had left and she just came back home. And the dogs are, are praising her return. So I'm going to go ahead and we'll close it at that. Mike, thanks. This is fun. I think we should probably do this more. That's awesome. It is fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll talk to you later. And then next week, everybody, I'm going to have this. Um, I don't know if he considers himself a creationist or intelligent design advocate or what, but he's very much anti-origin of life science. He wants people to stop doing the science. He thinks it's bad. And so he's going to come on and we're going to I'm, I'm going to let him explain why he thinks that. And then I'm going to explain why I would. Um, support that research and why I, you know, if I was handing out funding, that's one of the things I would hand out funding to. So it'll be a, and it'll be a fun conversation. I think hopefully it'll be a well-mannered one. We won't have a moderator. So, uh, you know, but he's, he's, he's a grown up. He's, we've been emailing back and forth for a while. We've, we've, we've talked on the phone once. So I think it'll be good. So until next time, stay curious, everyone. See you, John. Thanks. See ya.